Book of Heaven, Volume 29, Part 5 April 4th, 1931 The I love you is thunder. The divine will is heaven. Our humanity is earth. The Pains of the Heart of Jesus Exchange of Life The Divine Will Origin, Means, and End My abandonment in the arms of the Most Holy Supreme Will continues. And even though I feel myself under the thick clouds of inexpressible bitternesses, which take away from me the beauty of the divine light, and if I feel it, it is behind these clouds. Yet, as I say my I love you, and do my acts in the fiat, the thunder is formed, and unleashing the lightning, it rips the clouds open, and through those rips, the refulgent light enters into my soul and brings me the light of the truth that Jesus wants to manifest to his little creature. It seems to me that the more I repeat my I love you, the more often I thunder and lightning, and these lightnings, piercing the clouds, Wound my highest good, Jesus, who wounded, sends me his light as herald of his little visit to his embittered daughter. So, while I was in this state, my beloved Jesus came in a pitiful and afflicted state. His arms were broken from the grave offenses received. And throwing himself into my arms, he asked me for help in so many pains. I was unable to resist, and while clasping him in my arms, I felt his pains being communicated to me, but so many as to feel myself dying. So I fell into the abyss of my painful state. Fiat, fiat. But the thought of being able to relieve Jesus with my little pains gave me peace. And although Jesus had left me alone in the pains, later he came back and told me, My daughter, true love can do nothing, nor can it suffer if it does not share it with one who loves me. How sweet is the company of dear ones in the pains! Their company mitigates my pains, and I feel as if they were giving life back to me. And to feel life being given back to me by dint of pains is the greatest love that I find in the creature and I give her my life again in exchange. So the love is so great that they exchange the gift of life, one for the other. But do you know who drew me into your arms to ask you for help in my pains? The continuous thundering of your I love you which, making bolts of lightning, drew me to come to throw myself into your arms to ask you for relief. Moreover, you must know that my divine will is heaven. Your humanity is earth. Now, as you keep doing your acts in it, you take heaven. And the more acts you do, the more room you take in this heaven of my fiat. And while you take heaven, my will takes your earth, and heaven and earth are fused together 
and remain dissolved, one within the other. After this, I continued my abandonment in the divine fiat, and blessed Jesus came back with his heart open, from which blood was pouring. And in that divine heart, one could see all the pains of Jesus, which he suffered in all the parts of his divine person, all centered in the heart. Even more, in it was the place and the origin of all his pains, that, spreading through all of his most holy humanity, rose back like many rivulets into his most holy heart, bringing to it the torment that his whole divine person suffered. And Jesus added, My daughter, how much I suffer! Look at this heart of mine. How many wounds! How many sorrows! How many pains it hides! It is the refuge of all pains. There is no sorrow, nor spasm, nor offense, which does not pour into this heart of mine. My pains are so many that, unable to bear the bitterness, I keep looking for one who wants to accept a few little particles of these pains to have a sigh of relief. And when I find her, I keep her so dear to me that I cannot leave her ever again, nor do I feel lonely any more. I have someone whom I can make comprehend my pains, to whom I can confide my secrets, and in whom I can pour my flames of love that consume me. This is why I often ask you to accept part of my pains, because they are many. And if I don't go to my children to ask for relief, to whom should I go? I would remain like a father without children, who either has no offspring, or his ungrateful children have abandoned him. Oh, no, no, you will not abandon me. Isn't it true, my daughter? And I, my Jesus, I will never abandon you, but you shall give me grace. You shall help me in my present conditions, and you know how painful they are. My Jesus, help me, and I too say to you from the heart, Oh, please do not abandon me. Do not leave me alone. Oh, how vividly I feel the need of you. Help me. Help me. And Jesus, assuming a sweeter appearance, took my poor soul in his hands and in the depth of it he wrote, I place my divine will in this creature as origin, means, and end. And then he repeated, My daughter, I place my divine will in your soul as origin of life, from which all your acts will descend as though from one single point, and diffusing in all your being, in the soul and in the body, they will make you feel the palpitating life of my divine will in you, which will hide within itself, as though inside a aquarium, all your acts 
as continuation from its divine origin. Now by having my divine will as origin, you shall remain fully ordered in your Creator, and shall recognize that every origin comes from God, and shall give us the glory and the requital of love of all created things which have come out of our creative hands. By doing this, you shall embrace the work of creation, of which we were the origin, the life, and the preservation. From the origin, you will pass to the means. You must know that man, by withdrawing from our divine will, denied the origin and disordered himself, and he remained vacillating, without support, without strength. At each step, he felt himself pushed to fall as though feeling the ground missing under his feet, and heaven over his head, in act unloading itself upon him in a fierce storm. Now a means was needed in order to firm up the earth and make heaven smile. And here is my coming upon earth as means to reunite heaven and earth. God and man. So, to one who has my divine will as origin, the means is revealed, and she shall embrace the whole work of redemption, and shall give me the requital of love and the glory of all the pains that I suffered in order to redeem man. Now, if there is the origin and the means, there must be the end. The end of man is heaven, and for one who has my divine will as origin, all of her acts flow into heaven as the end which her soul must reach, and as the origin of her beatitude, which will have no end. And if you have my divine will as end, you shall give me the glory and the requital of love for having prepared a celestial fatherland for creatures as their happy dwelling. Therefore be attentive, my daughter, and I seal in your soul my divine will as origin, means, and end. That will be for you life, the safe guide, the support, and shall lead you in its arms to the celestial fatherland. Fiat April 16, 1931 Courage is of resolute souls Six angels with Jesus at the head of them How the acts done in the divine will are pledges of infinite value, eternal bonds, chains not subject to breaking. My life continues under the empire of the eternal fiat, which envelops me inside and outside of me, and makes me feel its infinite weight. And I, like Adam, remain enveloped by this infinity that has no limits. And as much as I love it and long for it, I feel vividly the pain of my human will, crushed and almost dying under the empire of a divine will, immense and eternal. My Jesus, help me and give me strength in the painful state I find myself in. 
my poor heart bleeds and seeks a refuge in so many pains you alone my jesus can help me oh please help me do not abandon me and while my poor soul was pouring itself out in sorrow my sweet jesus made himself seen in my interior crucified with six angels three on the right and three on the left of his adorable person each of these angels held a crown in his hands studded with most refulgent gems an act of offering them to our lord i remained surprised in seeing this and my beloved jesus told me courage my daughter Courage is of souls resolute to do good. They are imperturbable under any storm. And while they hear the roaring of the thunders and lightnings to the point of trembling, and remain under the pouring rain that pours over them, they use the water to be washed and come out more beautiful and heedless of the storm they are more than ever resolute and courageous in not moving from the good they have started discouragement is of irresolute souls which never arrive at accomplishing a good courage sets the way courage puts to flight any storm courage is the bread of the strong courage is the warlike one that knows how to win any battle therefore good daughter courage do not fear and besides what do you fear I gave you six angels for your custody. Each of them has the task to guide you through the interminable ways of my eternal volition, so that you may requite with your acts, with your love, what the divine will did by pronouncing six fiats in creation. So each angel is entrusted one fiat, and what came out of this fiat to call you to requite each of these fiats, even with the sacrifice of your life. These angels gather your acts and form with them a crown. And prostrate, they offer it to the divinity as requital for what our divine will did, so that it may be known and form its kingdom upon earth. But this is not all. I myself am at the head of these angels, guiding you and watching over you in everything, and forming in you the very acts and that love which is needed, so that you may have sufficient love to be able to requite so many great works of our supreme volition. Therefore, do not stop. You have much to do. You have to follow me, who never stops. You have to follow the angels, because they want to fulfill their task entrusted to them. You have to fulfill your mission of daughter of the divine will. After this, I was feeling concerned. And fearing, I thought to myself, the circumstances of my life are most painful, so much so that oftentimes I feel myself succumbing under so long a storm, which gives no sign of ending. On the contrary, it often seems to rage more. And if our Lord does not give me help and superabundant grace, 
my weakness is so great that I feel as if I wanted to go out of the divine will. And if, may it never be, this happens, poor me, everything will be lost. But while I was thinking this, my adorable Jesus, extending his arms toward me, in act of sustaining me, told me, My daughter, you must know that the acts done in my divine will are everlasting and inseparable from God, and they leave the continuous memory that the soul had the good of operating together with a divine will, and that God had the creature with himself to let her operate with his own divine will. This happy, operative, and holy memory makes us always keep our eyes over each other, God and the soul, in such a way that we remain unforgettable, one to the other, so much so that if the creature had the misfortune of going out of our will, she will go wandering. She will wander far, but will feel the eye of her God over her, calling her sweetly, and her own eye toward the one who is watching her continuously. And even if she goes wandering, she feels the irresistible need, the strong chains that pull her into the arms of her Creator. This happened to Adam, because the beginning of his life was lived in my divine will. Even though he sinned, was cast out of Eden, went wandering for all his life, yet was he perhaps lost? Ah, no, because he felt over himself the power of our will in which he had operated. He felt our eye watching him, and drawing his eye to watch us, as well as the dear memory that the first fruits of his acts had had life in our will. You cannot comprehend all the good and what it means to operate in our will. By operating in it, the soul acquires as many pledges of infinite value for as many acts as she does in our fiat. And these pledges remain in God himself, because the creature does not have the capacity or the place in which to keep them. So great is the value they contain. And can you ever think that while we have these pledges of infinite value of the creature, we would permit that she to whom these pledges so precious belong be lost? Ah, no, no. Therefore do not fear. The acts done in our will are eternal bonds, chains not subject to breaking. And suppose you went out of our divine will, which will not be. You can go out, but your acts remain, nor can they go out, because they were done in our house. And the creature has her rights for as long as she remains in our house, that is, in our will. As soon as she goes out of it, she loses her rights. However, these acts will have such power as to call back the one who was their possessor. Therefore, do not want to trouble the peace of your heart. Abandon yourself in me, and do not fear. Fiat April 24th, 1931 how God, in operating, requires the acts of the creatures as the little ground on which to place his works. Who forms the breath, the heartbeat of creation? 
the works of God, bearers of life. I was continuing my acts in the divine fiat. Oh, how I would love that nothing would escape me of what it has done, both in creation and in redemption. To be able to compete with my little, incessant, I love you, I adore you, I thank you, I bless you, and I pray you that the kingdom of the divine will come upon earth. But while I was thinking of this, my lovable Jesus told me, My daughter, even though our divine operating superabounds, but so much that the creature cannot arrive at taking all the superabundance of the goods that we put in our creative works, yet, in order to operate, we always require the little operating of the creature. And according to the more or the less of her operating, so we dispose the more or the less of the goods that we want to give in the work we want to do for the good of creatures. In fact, their operating serves us as little ground or space on which to place our goods. If a ground or space is small, we can place little. If it is large, we can place more. And if we want to place more, she will be incapable of taking and of comprehending what we have given her. See then how necessary is the little operating of the creature, so that our works may have life in the midst of the human generations. More so, since as the creature begins her little acts, her prayers, her sacrifices, in order to obtain the good that we want to give her, she places herself in communication with her Creator. She opens a sort of correspondence, and all her acts are nothing other than little letters that she sends to him, in which she now prays now cries, and now offers him her own life, to move him to give the good that we want to give her. This disposes the creature to receive it, and God to give it. If it were not so, the way would be missing, and all communications would be closed. The knowledge of the one who wants to give the gift would be missing. And it would be like giving and exposing our gifts to hostile people, who are neither loved by us nor lovers of us, which cannot be. While when we want to do a work, we always elect someone who loves us and whom we love because love is the seed, the substance, the life of our works. And when love is missing, the respiration, the heartbeat of a work are missing, and the gift received is not appreciated. And by not appreciating it, there is the danger for it to die at birth. Hear then the necessity of your acts, and of the sacrifice, even of your life, in order to make my divine will known, and to make it reign. There is no greater work than this, and this is why I want your repeated acts, your incessant prayers, and your prolonged sacrifice of a life buried alive. This is nothing other than the spacious ground on which to place such a great good. Each act of yours is a little letter that you send to us, and we, in reading it, say, Ah, yes, there is someone who wants our will upon earth, and who wants to give her own life 
in order to make it rain. With this, we dispose things, the graces, the events, in order to fill your little ground. And we wait for you to expand it more, in order to place the great gift of the kingdom of our will. This happened in redemption. I waited for so long to descend from heaven to earth in order to give the chosen people sufficient time to prepare. With their acts, prayers, and sacrifices, the little ground on which I could place the fruits of redemption, which were so superabundant that creatures are yet to take everything. And if they had done more, I would have given more. And if I had wanted to give more without even a comma, a dot of their acts, it would have been for them like an illegible book, whose language is unknown, like a treasury as though without key, such that one does not know what is inside. In fact, the act of the creature is the eye that reads, and the key that opens, in order to take my gift. And besides, to give without the gift given being known, it would have been a sorrow, and unworthy of our wisdom. Therefore, be attentive in following my divine will. The more you will follow it, the more you will recognize it, and the more superabundant it shall be in giving its goods. After this, I was continuing my round in creation, to unite myself to the acts done by the divine will in it. And my sweet Jesus added, My daughter, the breath, the heartbeat, the blood circulation of creation, is our love, adoration, and glory. We placed in it what we are in ourselves. Our nature is most pure love, and our sanctity is so great that what this love produces are nothing other than profound adoration and perennial glory to our divine being. So, in putting out the creation, we had to put what we possess nor could we put things that did not belong to us. Therefore, the heartbeat of creation is love, and as it palpitates, it pearls it with new love, which, giving it the race of circulation, repeats incessantly, adoration and glory to our Creator. Now if the creature goes round in the created things, placing her love, she places her own, and takes our love, and makes new love arise, to wait for her again, in order to receive, and to give its love. There's a footnote here referring to the word its, meaning love's love. So beginning at that sentence. Now, if the creature goes around in the created things, placing her love, she places her own and takes our love and makes new love arise to wait for her again in order to receive and to give love's love. So an exchange takes place and a contest between the created things and the creature, which, uniting together, give love, adoration, glory to our Supreme Being. Therefore, if you want to love, think that all created things have our mandate to give you love, as long as they receive yours. In this way, the feast of our love will be maintained in heaven and on earth, 
and you shall feel the happiness of our love. And the breath of love, the heartbeat of the adoration, will be substituted in you. And perennial glory to your Creator will circulate in your blood. Now, you must know that our works are full of life. Our creative strength has the virtue of placing the vital seed in all the works we do and of communicating it to the creatures who make use of them. Creation is packed with our creative works. Redemption is an immense field of our actions done so that they might bring to creatures the life and the good that they contain. So we are surrounded by the magnificence of our works. But we have the sorrow that these works are not taken, and many of them are not even known by creatures, and therefore are as though dead for them. In fact, they bring life and produce fruits of life for as much use as they make of them. And to keep so many vital works exposed, so many properties of ours, without producing the fruits they contain, and even more, to see the creatures poor, weak, and without the life of true good, grieves us so much that you cannot comprehend into what condition of sorrow creatures put us. We find ourselves in the condition of a father who, having many children, prepares lunch. And while he prepares it, he is all in feast, thinking that his children will not be starving, but will eat of his own. Then he sets the table. He arranges the plates with a variety of the foods he has prepared. Then he calls the children, that they might come and enjoy the nice foods he has prepared. But the children do not listen to the voice of the father, and the lunch is left there without anyone touching it. What is not the sorrow of this father in seeing that his children do not sit at his table and do not nourish themselves with the foods he has prepared? The mere looking at the table, filled with foods, causes him sorrow. Such are we in seeing that the creatures do not care about the many works we have done with so much love for them. Therefore, the more you will take of our own, the more divine life you shall receive. You will make us more content, and shall heal our deep wound of human ingratitude. Fiat You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 29, Part 5. Fiat